Yo. Yeah. We got the introductory to the Slavic slave trade. Y'all then said one billion times based on one of our videos that we did about uh, y'all don't know that Slavic means slave. Slavic means slave. Slavic means slave. Slavic means slave. Slavic, Slavic, Slavic. So we're going to go and do a introduction to the Slavic slave trade yeah we i mean we're still learning we're very yeah new in this space but i love learning things so let's go let's and then see what they say people were also oh wondering they were like they were kind of like how why don't we know about this because i was not interested in slavery when i was going through school i didn't want to i wanted to hear less about it as possible well yeah and you know many people tap into history because that's something mm-hmm. that really really interests them mm-hmm. and others do not because just knowing that your people went through something for an extended amount of years and then perhaps to really go and, and learn even more about it. Because once you have the information, what are you doing with it? Right. You're not using it unless, you know, this is going to be a profession or blah, blah, blah. You're teaching the stuff. Like, so what are you doing with the information? Knowledge to knowledge to do what with? Right. It's not like I'm going to sit here and have a conversation with the average Joe Blow about the Slavic slave trade, the Atlantic slave trade. Yeah, they wouldn't understand anyway if you were having that kind of I mean, conversation. But why would they want to have that conversation unless it's just knowledge being passed around or Probably. transformed? Yeah. Before any meaningful introduction into the history of the Slavic slave trade can be conducted, first we must address the etymology of the word slave. But even before that, this video was made possible thanks to my patrons and YouTube members. If you want to support what I do, it would be tremendously appreciated if you checked out my Patreon. Latin word for slave was servus, or servi in plural. This word survived in usage even after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, because Latin still largely remained the governing language of both the state and the church. Of course, some new Germanic words for slaves were sometimes used interchangeably with the Latin ones, like Theo in Old English or Thrall in Old Norse, but largely, in most written documents, the Latin word servus remained the most dominant word for slave in early medieval Europe. However, this dominance of the word servus at a time when slavery lacked the standardization and uniformity of the old Roman system meant that the word began to be increasingly ambiguous in its definition. In other words, there are a lot of different types of servitude and the word servus, ever since the 5th century, was increasingly ambiguous about the type of servitude it was referring to. As Alice Rio states, It is almost impossible to tell what exactly the word servus was intended to describe when it is found in an early medieval text without further contextual information. For example, when the law books of King Stephen mention some servi in charge of a castle, these are most certainly royal servants, not okay. slaves. However, when in the same time period, King Ladislaus orders that the escaped servi be captured, punished and returned to their masters, he was most definitely referring to slaves, not royal servants. To add even more confusion, during the early to high middle ages, a linguistical shift occurred where the word servus started to increasingly mean serf rather than slave. And by the late middle ages, servus was almost exclusively used to refer to serf. Where's not slaves. Life, so. In fact, the modern English word serf comes from the Latin word servus. This changing of the meaning of the word servus over the course of the Middle Ages presented a problem, because even though, yes, certain kind of feudal serfdoms could resemble slavery, serfdom in practice and in medieval legal terms was never actual slavery. Therefore, the word servus could no longer be used to mean slave, and so a new word had to be adopted. There were several candidates for this new word. For example, the Latin word for a captured person, captivus, was sometimes used in the Middle Ages as the word for a slave, either in combination with the word servus or on its own. The previously mentioned other Latin words, which could mean slave, were also sometimes used. However, what eventually became the most common type of word to define a slave was not some kind of a Latin word, but an ethnonym. To explain, enslaved people were often recorded as captivus or servus or both plus an ethnonym e.g. servus captivus well or captivus sardus 
After a while, especially if the slaves being captured and sold in a particular area were regularly the same ethnicity, these written records became abbreviated to just the ethnonym. So, in areas like in early medieval England, where most of the slaves captured were Welsh, the Latin word for Welsh, whale, became for a bit synonymous with the word slave. Same thing happened in medieval Genoa with the ethnonym Sardus, meaning Sardinian, and with many other ethnonyms in other slave trading areas. However, there was one ethnonym to rule them all. One ethnonym that would not only become synonymous with the word slave, it is where the word slave comes from. And that ethnonym is Slav. Thank you. Or Sklavos in medieval Latin. Or Sklavos in Byzantine Greek. But to understand how the Slavic ethnonym became the... Hold on, let me, let me turn this fan on because I'm starting to get smoking over here. For almost every Western language's word for slave, we must talk about the history of the medieval Slavic slave trade. The first undisputed appearance of the Slavs in the written record was in the mid-6th century on the Byzantine northern border. The Byzantines wrote that these people were called Sklavenoi or Sklavoi when shortened, or when Latinized, Sklaveni or Sklavi when shortened. These Latin and Greek names for the Slavs were obviously derived from the Slavic endonym Slovane, which either came from the Slavic word Slovo, meaning word, or Slava, meaning glory. There were slight variations in the way the Slavic ethnonym was written in the early medieval texts, but over the course of the Middle Ages, their shortened versions for the name, that is Sklavoi in Greek and Sklavi in Latin, became the standard. The early Slavs of the 6th century proved increasingly bothersome for the Byzantines, mainly because the Slavs weren't unified, which meant it was really hard for the Byzantines to control them. If Byzantium made peace with one tribe, there were 10 other tribes that it didn't apply to. As a result of this disjointed nature of the Slavs, there were some Slavic tribes that held frequent independent raids into the Byzantine Balkan territories, while other Slavic tribes settled in those territories. Some tribes allied themselves with the various Central European peoples like the Kutrigurs, the Gepids and the Lombards and fought with them in frequent wars, all while some Slavic tribes allied themselves with the Byzantines and fought alongside them, and some entrepreneurial Slavs simply fought as mercenaries for anyone who would hire them. This disjointed nature of the Slavs, combined with the 6th century political instability of Central Europe, resulted in a structure in which Slavs could be easily captured through frequent wars and raids and sold into the Mediterranean slave markets, which were still alive even after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Capturing slaves in wars and raids, however, wasn't a new thing, nor was it initially more common in Central and Eastern Europe than in other parts of Europe. The Byzantines and Sassanids often enslaved each other's people during war, as did the various post-Roman Germanic kingdoms. With that said, between the 7th to 8th centuries, there was a steady increase in written documents mentioning Slavic slaves. To give some examples, there is a 7th century account of Justinian II selling Slavic slaves in Anatolia, there is an 8th century mention of Slavic slaves being sold in Thessaloniki, there is another 8th century mention of Bavarian slave raids into Thuringia, today's Slovenia, and there is also a particularly interesting mention of a Slavic female slave in the Freising diocese called Sashka the Slav. However, the steady increase of Slavic slaves in the 7th to 8th centuries was nothing compared to the 9th and 10th centuries explosion of Slavic slavery. This explosion of Slavic slavery in the 9th and 10th century can be attributed to multiple factors. The first and most important factor was the establishment of the quite rich Islamic Caliphate, which had a huge demand for slaves. Second, unlike in the South or West, political power in Eastern Europe was still very disjointed, meaning it was much easier to raid the numerous Slavic tribes and polities for slaves than more established larger kingdoms. Third, the newly consolidated Frankish Empire, even though largely moving away from slavery in favor of serfdom, was in a perfect position to not necessarily use the slaves they captured on their eastern frontier, but sell them into the Mediterranean slave markets. How are you feeling so far? Mm, I mean, it's kind of just giving us a history based off of the Slavic slave trade. Yeah. And it sounds like pretty much how it was in other places. Mm -hmm. They had different tribes that, you know, fought against each other, mm -hmm. you know, that enslaved one another, that were, then you had some that stood alone, that was just about that life and wanted to, you know, help anybody. But it's still just giving you the history of this particular um, area. But it sounds no different from, and he's giving feedback as to where the names 
came from, from and yeah. how many different names they had. Right. And it was a lot of names. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of names before they came down and settled at Slavic. So Fourth, considering that by this point all the major religions forbade the enslavement of people adhering to the same faith, the still largely pagan Slavs proved to be the perfect source of pagan slaves. Oh, so they forbid it slaves of the same faith. Wow. That's interesting. Wow. No, it's like, okay. Well, that wasn't how it was for Christianity. Mm. They didn't give a rat kind they of detail care, about they, that. They didn't care about it all. <laughs> Lastly, fifth, the emergence of the Viking raiding and trading network in the 9th century opened up new trade routes in Eastern Europe through which Slavic slaves could be more easily captured and sold to Byzantium or the Caliphate. And so, due to all these reasons, the Slavic slave trade blew up in the 9th and 10th centuries as the lands of Eastern Europe proved to be the perfect source of new slaves. Due to this boom in Slavic slavery, new trade routes developed that began in Eastern Europe and flowed into the markets of the Mediterranean, Black and Caspian Seas. These trade routes could initially be divided into two major areas of operation, the Western trade routes and the Eastern trade routes. In the East, the Slavic slave trade was largely dictated by Vikings, known as Varangians in Eastern Europe, the Byzantines and nomadic polities like the Khazars, Volga Bulgars and Hungarians. The majority of slaves from Eastern Europe were sold to the Islamic Caliphate. It should, therefore, not be surprising that many of the written records we have about these Eastern trade routes come from Arab explorers and geographers like Ibn Fadlan or Ibn Narusta, the latter of whom stated that the Varangians raid the Sakaliba, the Slavs, sailing in their ships until they come upon them, take them captives and sell them in Khazaria and in Bulgaria. They have no cultivated fields and they live by pillaging the land of the Sakaliba. They have no dwellings, villages or cultivated fields. They earn their living by trading. They treat their slaves well and dress them suitably, because for them they are an article of trade. Mm. Ibn Rusta also mentions the Hungarians, or in other words the Magyars, while they were still living in the Pontic Steppe. They, the Magyars, are lords over all the Sakaliba who neighbor them and impose a heavy tribute on them. These Sakaliba are completely at their mercy like prisoners. They make piratical raids on the Sakaliba and then follow the coast of the Black Sea with their captives to a port in Byzantine territory named Kerch. When the Magyars bring their prisoners to Kerch, the Greeks go there to trade. The Magyars sell their Sakaliba slaves and buy Byzantine brocade, woolen rugs and other products of the Byzantine Empire. Slave raiding parties of Khazars, Bulgars, Hungarians, Varangians and rival Slavic tribes were a common place in medieval Eastern Slavic life. There were even mentions of Slavic raiding parties along the Danube River which sold Slavic slaves to Byzantium. The Byzantines also often enslaved the Slavs living on their northern border. As Yuval Rotman states, for the Byzantines the taking of captives and their enslavement seem to have been the general rule in the Balkans until the 11th century. So I say, you know, it's, I was just thinking, man, they really had it rough, you know, mm -hmm. back then because you're living in a place, you're in your dwelling, and then all of a sudden, Vikings or other nationalities are coming through, primarily the Vikings, they say Hungarians, you know, were coming through the Byzantines and just destroying your your um, inhabitant, and then you're uprooted and put on a ship. It was like, they didn't stand a chance. Did they have no weapons? They didn't have guns Good question. back then? Or did they? No, they didn't have guns. You know what, back then was, uh, you know, you could tell that the times back then were very simple, but then also there were no rules. Right. There were no rules. Treacherous. Every man for himself, really. And then if you get together with this group, y'all stick together, but then the next thing you know, the last man standing is going to make the other one be the slave. You know, you fighting to the, to the end. That was like. That's kind of crazy. Yeah, that's tough. Okay. That's Interesting. All right.